a common application and a very useful one of using magnetic fields to manipulate the path of motion of charged particles is the mass spectrometer. A charged particle based on its charge, speed, and also mass will go in a circular path of different radiuses, radii. Using that, we can actually sort different charged particles based on their masses and with a very, very high resolution. And so here's a question demonstrating that. It really is just an application of what we've been doing so far. Now, the mass spectrometer usually is comprised of two parts. That's where they talk about the velocity selector because it's important that all the particles have a known velocity as it enters into the part where we actually do want to bend them in a circular path. And then there's another magnetic field that separates the ions. So you have some source of ions that shoots out charged particle. It goes through this thing called the velocity selector. We'll look at the inner workings of that in a second. But what it essentially do is only the ion with the perfect speed will go straight through. Some of them will veer it off this way and some will veer off the other way. And to stop that from going through, we have a plate with a tiny little hole and the ions with the right velocity will get will make it through. And then this is exposed to and then the charged particle enters into a region of another uniform magnetic field. And based on if it's positive or negative charge, it will veer one way or the other. But either way, they will go in a circular path. And then when it hits down here, we have some kind of detector. So then we can measure the diameter and therefore the radius of their path. And based on that, we can work out its masses. So let's take this one step at a time then. Let's look at the velocity selector first. In the velocity selector, we're making use of the fact that magnetic forces depends on the speed of the particle. The faster the particle is traveling, the stronger the magnetic force. However, this is also true for a particle with higher charge. So to cancel out the charge, what we do is we make use of the fact that the electric force also depends on charge in a specific electric field and we can set that up. So we want a geometry such that we have a particle moving that away and we want the magnetic force to point perpendicular to that in some way because it always does but also opposite to that direction we set up an electric force opposite to that. So then in order for us not to get any acceleration in the y direction the two forces must cancel out. They must equal one another. To make our lives easier, we often just set up the magnetic field perpendicular to the velocity so that the expression for the magnetic force is just multiplying all their magnitudes together without worrying about the cross product. And then we have Q times E for the electric force because electric field is normalized force. That way we can cancel out the charge and we're just left with the dependence of the velocity, which you can find out. But let's take a moment here to, to look at the geometry that is needed in order for my electric forces and magnetic forces to go the same way. So let's pretend that we have some kind of positive charge. So given this positive charge, for the electric force to point downwards, the electric field must also point downwards. The magnetic field then because V goes forward, Q is positive, so we'll put our thumb in this case to the right. We would put our twist around so that my middle finger, which is my force, point upwards. So that must mean my magnetic field must go into the page. So in that sense, it's kind of set up like a cross. If we spin this around to look at the velocity pointing outwards, we see that we have the electric field going that way and the magnetic field going that way, which is perpendicular to the electric field to begin with. So that's the geometry that we want in order for this to happen. You can quickly do the same thing with a negative charge and you'll find that the exact same electric field will give us the same effect because then the electric force will point upwards but the magnetic force will point downwards and everything else still works out. So once we have that, the rest of it is actually quite simple. We basically take the two 
magnetic field and electric field magnitude and we divide them. But I just want to show you how the thing got constructed and everything comes together. This will actually use as Newton's per coulomb equivalent. A Tesla is defined in this way so that we can cancel a bunch of things to finally give us some meters per second. It's always good to check that the units work out and then that's the speed. Now the way we've got a range for a positive particle, you can appreciate that if the particle travels too fast, the magnetic force will be stronger than electric force, so the thing would veer up. Whereas if it's too slow, your magnetic force just gets too weak and then it'll veer down. So that's why only precisely it must go at this particular speed for it to stay going undeflected into the next part. And this next part is simply a uniform magnetic field with a charged particle, so you know it goes in a circle. I think I actually drawn the direction wrong here for a positive particle anyway, because we are saying lithium. They don't exactly tell us if it's positive or negative, but they don't ask us which way it goes anyways. But I'm going to assume it's Li+, plus because it's an, it's an alkaline metal where it sits on the periodic table. So for a positive particle, uh, given this magnetic field, the force actually goes upward, so it's supposed to curl around like that. In any case, we know that for that part, the magnetic force is my m times centripetal acceleration. And since everything is nice and perpendicular, the way we've designed it, we don't have to take the cross product, it's just taking all the magnitudes and multiplying them together. And we're not using the B from the velocity selector, we're using the B in that part. So just make sure you use the right magnetic field in the right part. Here they're saying singly charged, and I'm assuming it's positive, so then Q is going to be one elementary charge. That's what singly charged means. And then the rest is just rearranging and solving. We're looking for M, so let's rearrange so we cross those out and then we'll get that and so we sub everything in as given in the problem and the speed we got from the velocity selector the unit should work out but it's good to double check it anyways uh, Tesla is given as that by definition whereas a Newton F equals ma so we got that you strike that out you left with one over second coulombs go away with coulombs Meters go away with that, and the one over second divide goes away with the one over second, so you are left with, in fact, kilograms. And we would expect this to be quite small. Which, other curiosity, if you look up the mass of a proton, it's 1.67, something like that, minus 27 kilograms. So this is basically around the mass of seven protons, so for a lithium ion, you know that we have three protons, so the rest must be neutrons, so there's four neutrons, so that you know that's the isotope we're talking about. And that's what the mass spectrometer actually allows us to do. It is fine enough for us to get the mass of individual atoms to sort them out based on their masses, even if they only differ by the mass of a single proton. That's how amazing the mass spectrometer is. And you can see how this is useful in identify components of different chemical compounds, as well as once upon a time, it is also useful in sorting out different isotopes for developing nuclear fissionable materials, as well as moving forward, sorting out nuclear fusionable materials as well.